just open up our mouth and just begin to praise him in this place. God, we lift you up. God, we lift you up in this place. Our eyes are set on you. God, we're not looking at our circumstances. Lord, we lay that down at your feet in this place, God. God, I pray that you would fall afresh and anew upon every heart, God, that, that they would have a sense of your voice speaking to them clearly. God, would you come and move in this place? We welcome you. You are welcome here, God. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on. Rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here.
Come be our greatest desire, God. Come burn away the dross so that all we want is you, Lord. Set our hearts ablaze. Set our hearts ablaze. Come on, let's make this our heart cry. Say, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare than your living hope. Yes, Lord. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone right here with you in your presence
do something here right now. We'll finish singing that in a second. But I just feel like the Lord wants to heal some people today. Jesus is <laughs> if you will. And he said, I will. I will. If you need healing today, we're going to sing. We're going to continue to worship for a few moments. I just want you guys to say, come stand up here with me. Linda, come up here. We're going to pray for you. Some cancer diagnosis there that we're going to pray for. stand right up here with me. I'm going to ask Alicia. This one right here is Linda. Well, you pray for her too. <laughs> I want some believers that's just going to come and stand up here with us. And there's across this room right now, there's people that need healing. Come on, you have, you have, you believe in miracles. You believe in miracles. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 Chris, come over here, please. Would you pray right here? <laughs> oh, Spirit of the Lord in this place. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, there's several people coming up here. Those of you that know how to pray, I just want you to come and join your faith with them right now. Come on, you see someone standing by themselves. Don't you let that happen. Go minister to them. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we worship you. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Father, right now in the name of the Lord Jesus, we declare, Lord, that what you did at the cross purchased something for us. <laughs> you purchased something for us. <laughs> you purchased something for us. I thank you, Lord, that Isaiah said it like this, by your stripes we are healed. That took place at the cross. Peter came along and pointed back to the cross and said, there he purchased something for us and by his stripes we were healed. The healing was purchased for us at the cross. And right now in the name of the Lord Jesus, we take authority over every form of sickness, infirmity, of weakness, of disease, of, of brokenness in their bodies. Lord, I'm, I speak right now a miracle to take place in their bodies. Father, we embrace your word. We, we walk in what you said and we declare what you said over us. And I say that healing is the children's bread. It belongs to us. We're the children of the kingdom. And Lord, we just embrace that. And I speak healing over every person in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I speak for you to be healed from the top of your head, the very top of your head, all the way to the very bottom of your feet, I speak wholeness and strength and healing 
and deliverance and freedom in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just declare wholeness over these bodies. We declare righteous, righteous standing wholeness to be upon every person that's here today. We curse sickness. We, we declare it illegal. It's illegal. It does not belong in our bodies. It does not belong in our lives. Every demonic influence, every stronghold is broken in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every spirit of infirmity is broken in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we stand on your word and we trust in you and we look to you and we embrace, Lord, what you said, what you said over us, we say over ourselves. And we declare in the name of Jesus, wholeness and healing, wholeness and healing in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead and continue that if you would. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come from this place. The Come on, just receive it right now. Declare it, it's mine. It belongs to me. I am whole in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. We are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the earth. We speak strength. Your glory, God, is in our hearts. We speak strength to your bodies. We speak strength to your bodies in the name of your presence, Lord. By your presence, Lord. Oh, by your presence. Come on, just receive it. Receive it. Let's just take a moment. Just let the Lord just kind of do his thing here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, we worship you, we worship you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
around yourself and it's part of you and there's a lot of security in that but that framework was only to be temporary it was something that was going to sustain you until you grew to the place that it no longer fed you and it was necessary but the Lord is the Lord is going to put it within your heart to expand boundaries of your habitation and things that maybe you never thought of suddenly is going to fit and be a part of you in ways that you hadn't expected and things that you used to trust in and rely on suddenly doesn't fit anymore I'm not saying it's bad it just doesn't fit you know it's like clothes from the 70s it just doesn't fit well not for a while anyway 
But the Holy Spirit is doing something in you that's broader than you think. And I feel like the Lord is saying, don't put any limitations on me, nor judgments about anything that is happening around you because you don't know what the Lord is doing in the big picture. Your life is like a puzzle. We look at the piece of it, and many times it doesn't make sense to us. We're thinking, I recognize the color, I recognize the texture, the form, all of that. But God has the picture to the box. <laughs> he knows exactly what's going on. And he's in the process of enlarging you and taking you and growing you. And your limitations of your own mind will only hinder what he wants to do. So just like the Lord's saying, don't make judgments. Don't make prejudgments. Matter of fact, don't make judgments about anything. You just yield to the Holy Spirit. And things that you may have wanted to see, God, want, <laughs> God wants to deliver you from your opinion. it's the things that we know that hinders what we don't know. <laughs> and God's going to work in you and your whole house. God's going to do work in your whole house. So take off the limitations and cast off the barriers, the restraints, the expectations because you don't even know what to expect. <laughs> you just know there's something. There's, you don't even know what to expect but the Lord says, I know what. I'm doing a work. I'm doing a work. So, Lord, I just bless Christopher right now. I just declare the favor of God to be upon him. Let his mind be expanded. Let his heart be enlarged to receive what you've got. Let him walk not with the expectation of his own limitations, but, Lord, let him, let him, let him roam free. Let him run free without limitation. Let him, let him experience something that literally is so beyond him that he doesn't even know how to put words on it. But he loves it and he's embracing it. And most of all, his trust is in you. Most of all, his trust. So I, I declare over you right now, Christopher, I declare over you in the name of Jesus, freedom in your mind, your will, your emotions. Disappointments. I break the hold of disappointments over you. I declare in the name of Jesus, they will not have dominion over you on any level. The, the, the wounded aspect of your heart that you can manage, but God says, no, I don't want you to manage that. I want you to give that to me. And I'm going to take something that's broken and I'm going to make it something beautiful because I don't waste anything. I don't waste anything. So, Lord, I just speak freedom to his mind, his will, his emotions, his heart. And I pour in oil and wine in the name of Jesus. And I declare in his heart, his mind, his will, his emotions, and his heart, his being will be restored. Lord, I just speak that over him in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just speak that over him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Brother, would you go lay hands on Christopher? Yes. Just, I just want you to lay hands on Christopher. Father, I just speak right now, yes, in Jesus' name, I speak wholeness and strength. I speak, I speak, I speak the power and the peace of God. Peace. I, I, I declare peace over you. Your mind won't be tormented. Your mind won't be troubled. Fear shall have no dominion over you. I speak peace to you. I speak peace to you. And you're going to walk in calmness and peace and expectation of that which is good. And I bless you right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. What do we have here? Let's go. Shake down the walls of all my tradition. <laughs> Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls 
that's the word. My religion, that's the word. Your way is better. Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. Your way is better. Oh, shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Come on, we keep the worship. Your way is better. Tradition break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want. ever had that experience and you can try try the best you can but we get stubborn the Lord says lay that aside right now lay that aside what that means is yield yield 
yield. What does that mean to yield? Okay, God, <laughs> I give up. I, I, I yield. <laughs> You're the Lord. You're smarter than I am. You're wiser than I am. And I trust in you. Okay. I don't know everything. I don't know anything. I yield to you. Lord, right now, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts and heal our wounds. See, that's what's happened is, is you become wounded and then you make opinions about that. Then you become stubborn in it. You become grounded in it and you harden your heart. Right now, I speak right now freedom to you. Let the Holy Spirit come and cover your ground and heal the ground of your heart. The hard places, the stony ground, the stony ground that came because of wounds, that came because of experiences. That part of my heart became hardened and this part of my heart became hardened and it's like a stony ground the Lord is saying, come on, I'm going to take those stony places out. <laughs> and I'm going to replace them with flesh. <laughs> Soft, tender, yielding, yielding. Lord, I speak right now healing from stony ground. A stubborn heart. Deliverance from that, I pray. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Would you just reach over and join hands with somebody next to you if you're close enough to someone. Father, right now, we yield our hearts to you and we yield our hearts to one another. Let your presence right now cover us and minister to us, Lord. Let your glory come into this place, Lord, and touch our hearts and bring us into the place that we need to be. Lord, I love you, and I yield myself to you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Take that person you got by the hand. Just squeeze them until they smile. Tell them, say, oh, my goodness, I love you. Would you? Oh, I love you. I love you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This morning, we're going to bless the Lord with our giving, our tithing, our offering. If you want to, you can give electronically back in the back. But uh, I just want you to open your hearts this morning as we worship the Lord with our giving. It's such an important part of our, our life as to who we are. Uh, I, I think that in many cases, we live our life, uh, and it's almost like because of fear there's a tendency to live your life to yourself. There's a sense of self-preservation, which is very normal. I, I think that's something that is, is going to be a part of all of us. We'll always have a sense of, you know, I need to take care of myself. But, but the nature of God is giving. The, the very first thing that we hear about him, it says, for God so loved that he gave. And so the giving was a, was, was a reflection of something, something deeper on the inside. It's what we do. It's, it's, we give because we love. But we give because we trust. Somebody say, how can you trust? Because God is your source. God's my source. Now, I'm not just going around giving everything that I have away. I don't think that's God's will. I think there's discretion even in giving. Some people feel like if they get anything, they've got to give it all away. And that's not God's will at all. That's why even the tenth, the tithe, was such a small portion because God always wants you to have enough for investment, for building, for, for your future. He wants, he wants to build a sense of wealth in you. But the tenth, the tithe is set up as an acknowledgement that he's the one that brought the opportunities into your hand. And I trust him with it. And so what I do is, is I don't give everything I have away, but what I do is I listen to the Lord 
And he'll speak to me at times. I'll be going along and God will drop it in my heart to do something for somebody, to help somebody. The spirit-led giving is what it is. And so I have an opportunity to, to take the portion of what I have and be a blessing. Be a blessing. Can I just tell you this? I, I've said this for years. Always set aside a portion of what you have to give to the poor. That's very important to the heart of God. Very important. Always be someone who's, and not everything, but set aside a portion, just a little bit, because there's somebody that you're going to run into that's having a little bit of a difficult time. And God wants you to be a blessing. The blessing of Abraham was not you're going to get a blessing. The blessing of Abraham was you're going to be a blessing. So I may be at the grocery store sometime, and there's been times when I've been up and somebody was going to have a little struggle. I could tell they're counting out everything, just trying to make sure they've got enough. And I just had an opportunity then to just to take something from what I had and bless them and give to them. We used to always, in the tolls in Oklahoma, of course, they've got them everywhere there, but what they would do is, is people would pull up to the toll and they would pay for the person behind them. You know, just kind of passing it on, you know, hopefully that they did that to where when the person pulled up to the window that they said, well, the person in front of you paid your toll. And it's just an act of kindness. It's just an act of uh, being liberal. And that's an attitude. That's, a, that's something that's healthy for you as a believer. And I don't want you just to trust in God. I want you to be healthy in the way you live life and especially with your resource and your money. Money tells me <laughs> more about you than anything else. And I think one of your things that you should be known as is someone who's you're liberal. You're you're someone who is a giver. You're someone who thinks of others. And so this should be part of our heart because that's the heart of God. Okay, so this morning, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to acknowledge who the Lord is in our giving, and that's where we bring the tithe. And so we'll have an opportunity for you to bring it up to the front, or you can do it electronically. Bill, this handsome man here right in the hallway, he has, a, he has an envelope. Those of you that need one, he'll take care of you. Okay, thank you, Bill. And uh, electronically, we've got it on both sides. And so those of you that want to from there. So, Father, we want to say thank you for the privilege we have uh, help us, Father, just just a little lesson concerning our stewardship and a little lesson about giving, Father. I just pray that we'll always be givers, that we'll always be reaching to the poor, that we'll always be reaching to those that, that are less fortunate than we are. And so, Lord, just bless this congregation. Thank you, Father, for the liberality that they have. They've been so, this is a good church. This is a good church. And, Father, we thank you for it, and we just bless you. In the name of Jesus, and everybody say amen. So if you would, stand to your feet like you can stand to anything else. I don't know why we always say things like that. But stand, and if you will come and bring your tithing, your offering, and, and you can also do it on your phone, your smartphone. You can do that if you have a phone app.
say thank you today. We just lift up our hearts. We lift up our, our resources with gratitude and thanksgiving. I declare the favor and the blessings of a pastor over every single person that's in this place. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I feel like before we open the word that we need to just worship for just a little bit. What you're thinking, girl? For your mercy, fail me, fail me. all <laughs> my days. Let's all stand this morning. <laughs> have been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up. Till I lay my head, I will sing. Come on, can we just take a moment? Let's just take a moment. Just, just rest in that, would you, for just a moment? All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so. Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest hours. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, all my life, oh, all my life you have been faithful. We remember your faithfulness, Lord. All my life you have been so, so It's running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Say your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Because all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so glad With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing, I will sing of the goodness I will sing of your goodness, Lord the goodness of God. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help Give me wisdom, you know just what to do.
give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do, and I will love you. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. Oh, I love you, Lord. Come on, let's say that again, God. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, thank you. Don't you appreciate Vanessa? The just she drives in from Dallas area, but I feel like the Lord wants her to live here. What do you think? I have no shame. I, I <laughs> Vanessa, you are wonderful. Thank you, and, and as all of the wonderful team that we have. I'm very thankful for what God's given us and all of our music. You know, I was thinking of, uh, I, I guess I need to address real quickly, we've got a lot of exciting things happening in the world. Did you notice that? Anybody notice this last week? We've had a few situations rise up. Um, Trips to Israel are going to be real cheap here for the next few days. Those of you that want to go with us. <laughs> I know there's a feeling this is the end of the world. No, we're not there yet. We're really, really, really close. There's going to be wars and there's going to be rumors of wars. Jesus talked about that. He said, but the end is not yet. There's going to be some things that's going to come together. There's kind of a coalition of nations that are beginning together. We can see that happening. Of course, Iran is going to be right smack in the middle of it. The Bible speaks concerning Persia. Russia is going to be involved in that. You're going to see all the nations around that are going to be gathered together. And they're just kind of being pulled together at this point. It's almost like they're not even sure of what's taking place, but it's almost like a hook in their jaw, and they're just all being pulled together. And the prophetic word is going to be taking place. You know, I've been doing a study concerning Revelation. 
couple of things that the Bible talked to us about Revelation, and we've so, been so afraid of it, but a couple of things you need to understand about it. Number one, the Bible said, first of all, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and secondly is the fact he said, blessed is the man that reads this. And so we're blessed because we read this. Now, I know there's going to be some turmoil. There's going to be a couple of years where it's going to get kind of difficult. But the reason is, is because the Bible's speaking. I don't know whether you know it or not, but Satan has had authority in this earth for a long time. He usurped that authority from Adam. Remember when he talked to Jesus on the, on the Mount of Temptation? He, he told him, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these things, for they have been given to me, and I'll give them to whoever I want. Well, Jesus didn't argue with that. That was, that was a true fact. He, he obtained that authority. He obtained, and his root system has just grown through the, the media. It's grown through government. It's grown through just about every area that you could possibly think of. And so what's happening is, is, as we begin to look in the book of Revelation, we see there where the lamb takes the scroll out of the hand of him that sits upon the throne. Now, what is that scroll? It's the title deed to the earth. And he opens it up and he crushes all that authority that Satan has in every area. When he finishes, it's going to be ground to powder. And it's going to be rough, rough, rough on the kingdom of darkness. But I promise you that the kingdom of light shines. And let me just tell you something. We're not losing anything in this battle. Jesus Christ is Lord from the very beginning to the very end. There is no question concerning the authority of his lordship. Now, we'll get into this at a later time, but I just want to say this to you. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Israel is going to be fine. I saw a shirt when I was over there that said, Don't worry, America. Israel's got your back. <laughs> And, and, and that just you just ain't going to hardly get smarter than those dudes over there in that little sliver of land. And uh, it's going to be fine. Uh, there's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. But it's moving forward. And I'm just telling you something. We're at the closing moments of this dispensation. This dispensation is being the, the dispensation of the church. Because now the church for its whole purpose has been to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be joined in. And that's where we are. But now we're at the very close of that. It's the close of what we would know as the sixth day. But then we're in the 6,000th year since Adam was there, and we're about to go into the seventh day. What's that? That's the millennial rest. That's the day when Jesus is going to come, set his foot on the Mount of Olives, and it's going to be awesome. I'm telling you, <laughs> he's going to show up. Somebody said the big battle. There ain't going to be any battle. I'm telling you, that battle's going to last probably about 15 seconds. You know, the Bible says he's going to destroy his enemies with the brightness of his coming. What's the brightness of his coming? That's the glory that's going to come before him. That's when he told Moses, he said, you can't even look on me and live. The glory that was there, the, the glory, the radiance of his power and of his glory, and, and he's going to destroy, he's literally going to show up and his enemies are going to be destroyed. He's going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives. That was the place he ascended. That's where he said, he says, they said, in the same manner as you saw him taken away, he's going to come again. He's going to set his foot on that mountain. When he does, that mountain's going to split. There's going to be a huge, it's going to be awesome. The river's going to flow. Water's going to flow through that gap, and it's going to run right down into what we know as the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea is going to have life in it. It's going to be awesome. I'm just telling you, when Jesus shows up, things get green. <laughs> when I was, I was over there, I was looking around at that place, and I thought, it's a little bit of a fixer-upper. I'm not sure why you'd want to come here. <laughs> I, said, I know a few places in Texas that would be a whole lot better than this. But when he shows up, everything becomes beautiful. And I can't wait. <laughs> He's our champion. <laughs> On his thigh is tattooed. Those of you that don't like tats, you're going to have a bad day on that day. On his thigh is king of kings and lord of lords. <laughs> oh, <whew. laughs> It's going to be awesome. When Jesus comes, when Jesus, when Jesus comes, 
<laughs> Everything's going to change. Everything's going to change. There's a new sheriff in town, so to speak. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I can't wait. Oh, how glorious is that day. Listen to me. You know what our prayer should be? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> That's my prayer. Oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's not because I'm afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of him. You know, I remember I was just a little kid. I was like third grade, and I got kind of roughed up by a couple of fifth graders. And we was at the school, so I hooked them out of there because my brother was a sixth grader. And I, <laughs> I went, and he walked back there to the school with me, and all suddenly everybody started calling him sir. And I'd stick my head out from around him. I'd say, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't care what we're facing. When Jesus, our Lord, our King, our Savior walks into the room, we're okay. I trust in him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So don't worry about the things that's happening. Pray for Israel. Pray for the peace of Israel. They've been through a horrible, horrible thing. What happened to them is almost unspeakable as to what has happened to them. But you know what? They're going to get up on their feet. And they're going to be, because, because the, somebody said, and I've heard people talk about this. They've said, you know, we are spiritual Israel, and God's just kind of, you know, for Israel. Let me just tell you something. Israel is still the seed of Abraham. It's the seed of Abraham. Now, we have been grafted in, and I am the, the Bible said in Galatians 3.29, if I belong to Christ, I'm Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So I'm, like, I'm right there in the throne with him. But I'm just telling you something. God has not forgotten what he promised Abraham and to his seed and to his children, and he will not forsake them. So it's going to be okay. I, I hate to just paint too much optimism when there's so much despair, but I'm just telling you, <laughs> Jesus, he's still Lord. <laughs> he, he, Jesus, you're not going to get better and stronger than he is, wiser and, and more wonderful than our Lord and Savior Jesus. Let's just do that now. Let's just pray for Israel. Can we just do that? Father, we just want to say thank you for the covenant. You're a covenant-making God. <laughs> That's what you enjoy doing, I think, more than anything else. You enjoy making a covenant with a man, with a woman. You did that then, you do it now. But you made a covenant with a man by the name of Abraham. And it said, Abraham believed God. You said something to him, he believed you, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And that covenant burned between you and him, and it brought a nation together by Isaac and by Jacob and by Jacob's sons of the 12 tribes of Israel who you promised that they would come in and possess a land. You said that about them. Now, their enemies have been coming from every side for all of these years to try to destroy them, but they've not been able to resist your word and the promise that you made by covenant to a man by the name of Abraham. Lord, today we in Family Worship Center, we, we are the seed of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. And the promises that you made him rest on us. We walk in that covenant right along with Abraham. And so, Father, today we, from right here in Texas, we pray for Israel. And I'm asking, Father, that I put you in remembrance of what you said concerning them. I'm asking, Father, for you to remember what you said to them. I'm asking, Lord, I put you in remembrance of the promises that you made to them. It wasn't somebody, if it had been somebody else, we could have probably dismissed it. But you made that promise. <laughs> and you can't lie. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Lord, you promised. 
Father, I pray for them, and I lift up your promise to them before you. And I'm asking, Father, that you would strengthen them. I'm asking that you would cause the resolve of their hope to rise up. And don't let their hope be extinguished by the burning desires of the satanic forces that are around them that come to destroy them. I pray that you would confuse the enemy. I'm asking, Father, that there would be such confusion arise in their hearts that they turn on one another. I saw that happen, Lord. You did that in the days of Gideon. You, you've done that all through the word of God. Let, let them be confused within their own ranks. And let them turn on themselves, Lord. And I'm asking, God, that you would build a wall around your people, around that nation. We pray for the nation of Israel. I pray, Lord, for Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm asking God that you would strengthen him. I'm asking God that you would anoint him and that you would bless him for the task that he has. Bless him with boldness. I pray that America would have the courage to stand at their side. I pray, oh God, that you would bring allies together that will stand at their side. Thank you, Father. Give them favor. I pray. Give them favor, I pray. And I'm asking it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And we say thank you for it. And everybody say amen. 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 Okay, you feel better about Israel? I do. <laughs> They're going to be okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We would like to put together an Israel trip, but we are going to wait until the rockets stop flying. I th hopefully... <laughs> next year or sometime. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, can I just give you a principle real quick? Um, I've been thinking concerning Samson. The Bible said there in Judges chapter 13, um, Matter of fact, I think we can put that up there. As judges, I, I believe it's 13, 14. Uh, what did I have there? Yeah, 13 and 1. Let's, let's, just, let's just go over a couple of those verses, would you? It says, The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years, an entire generation. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said to her, Behold, now, you're barren. We can see that, but you're going to conceive and you're going to have a son. And then he said there in verse, verse 4, Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, don't drink wine nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. You know, in every situation that God ever had where people were, his people were being oppressed, he always raised up a deliverer. Always, in every situation, no matter what came, there was always a deliverer that came. Now, the deliverers are not perfect. Can I just tell you this? Samson was not perfect. Now, there's a reason why he probably wasn't perfect was because of his mom and dad. Now, here was a man and his, the wife, she was barren. They couldn't have any children. And so now this, you know, I mean, stop and think about this. You've been wanting to have a child. You can't have a child. You're, you're, what, you're what, the, what, what the Bible calls barren. And in those days, being barren, was that was a big deal. I mean, when you were barren, that was, that was, it was almost like a curse that rests upon you. Now, here this angel shows up and says, you're going to have a son. So not only were they barren and in desperate need, wanting to have a child, but now they have an angelic, a heavenly visitor that comes along. 
you know, over and say, you're going to have a child. Well, I'm just going to tell you something. You probably couldn't find another child that was more spoiled than Samson. His feet probably never touched the ground. I mean, <laughs> of course, what are you going to do? You, you've got the angel that says, this is a, you're going to have a son. You're going to bear a child, and he's going to grow up, and he's going to be a deliverer. He is the promised child. He's the hope of tomorrow. He's the, well, that's kind of how the kid grew up. And I'm sure that probably it was a situation that no one wanted to say anything to him. They probably let him get away with murder. I mean, just, you know, let him just get away with whatever he wanted to do. Why? Because he's Samson. I mean, good gracious, the angel appeared to us. What, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, he was a brat. Let me just tell you something. Samson was a brat, and it showed his entire lifetime he was a brat. He was full of rebellion. He did everything that he wasn't supposed to do. You know, he's decided, I'm going to go find me a gal. I'm going to go get married to her. And they're pleading with him. They're saying, Samson, please. I mean, seriously, is there no one in our tribes that you can find at all that you would go to the Philistines or that you would go to some other tribe? Nope, I'm going to do what I want to do. And he did. I'm just telling you, everything that Samson did, he pouted a lot. He had a tremendous problem with pouting. And he was destructive when he would pout. You know, I hate to bust this wonderful bubble of the great and mighty Samson, but he was a brat. I mean, when, when he didn't get his way, what did he do? He set the place on fire. I mean, that boy needed some counseling really bad. I mean, he, he took these foxes, tied their tails together, set them on fire, and sent them through all of the wheat, setting everything on fire. I mean, those people, no wonder they were so mad at him. I mean, he went around. He was, he was mad because he didn't get his way. <laughs> he goes into their festival. I mean, he's not supposed to be eating, touching anything unclean, dead. But he finds this lion, and he finds a beehive hooked up in this lion. I'm not sure how that had, but he takes the beehive. He, he is sweet. It was great. It makes my eyes light up. Took it and gave it to other people. And then he went in, and he was going to, he was going to get his bride, basically. And uh, he's, he said, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a riddle. He said, you tell me what the riddle is, and I'll give you this. Uh, if you don't tell me what the riddle is, you have to give me that. Now, I'll give you so many changes of clothes. Uh, there was clothes was a big deal in those days. But th this was something, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. Well, he gave them so many days to do it. And so they went to his fiance and they said, tell us what it is or we're going to kill you and we're going to kill your family. And, of course, she ended up telling him what it was. And so they came up on the day of reckoning, and they say, what's sweeter than honey? And then they talked about the carcass of the lion. <laughs> and Samson said, if you hadn't plowed my heifer, you wouldn't have found out my riddle. That's King James is what he said. <laughs> well, that's what he said. <laughs> and so he went out and killed a bunch of people brought their clothes back. I mean, he was just, he was destructive. He ended up with Delilah. I mean, Delilah, she's a harlot from, from the Philistines. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's who he's hanging out with. This is who he's hanging out with. I'm the chosen of God. I've got all of this that, and so my whole point is the fact that there's a lot of things that you see in people. Isn't it amazing how God uses that which is not perfect? We put a sense of standard of perfection on people that's not even realistic. It's the truth. A lot of times, I heard one man say one time, he said, the church is the only army in the world that kills its wounded. Let somebody get messed up, let somebody do something wrong, and they'll turn on him with vicious passion. But God here is using somebody that is just... <laughs> He's just a brat. He's doing everything wrong, but yet God uses him. Can I say this to you? You're not perfect. Turn to somebody and say, he's talking about me. <laughs> but God uses you anyway. 
we disqualify ourselves somehow thinking, and the problem with that is, is it takes about 30 seconds for us to turn to the fact of saying, God uses me because I'm so good, and we become self-righteous and think we earned it. God didn't, matter of fact, God chooses the weak. He chooses the small. He chooses the insignificant. Do you remember what they said concerning Jesus? In the book of Isaiah, it said he was a root out of dry ground. There was no, no form, no comeliness about him, no beauty that when we see him, there was nothing that we would desire of him. So here's the thing. God always uses that. As a matter of fact, he's liable to use somebody that you would swear no one could use. God's not limited by your performance. He's not. You'll never be good enough. Accept that. You'll never be perfect. Accept that. What do you do? You just simply yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, yielding yourself as, as, as a vessel unto God. That's what I do is I, I yield myself. But here was Samson. Samson was just imperfect. He, he, but there was something that came up in the story of Samson that I wanted to share with you. And this was from chapter 16 is when he was with Delilah. He was partying. I don't know how drunk he was, whatever, but he laid his head in her lap and he went to sleep. And she had been working on him all this time. Tell me what's your strength. Tell me what's the matter with you. Tell, how do you do this? I know your strength is there, Samson. Come on, tell me. And he teased her. He was a big, he was a big tease. He said, well, if you tie a rope around me, then this will happen. If you do this to me, then I'll be weak like anybody. And, and you know, the knucklehead should have. He wasn't very smart, I don't think, either. Because everything that he told her when he woke up, he had ropes on him. I'm thinking, boy, <laughs> what do they say? There's your sign. But he just thought that was the funniest thing in the world, and he just laughed. But the Bible said she put pressure on him and said he told her all his heart. And it said, she told the Philistines, said, he told me this time. I know his heart. And here's what the Bible said. Let's put that back up there if we would. And she made him to sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man and caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. The seven locks of his head. Now, you've got to go back there to chapter 13 where the Bible said no razor shall come upon his head. And so his hair was actually woven into seven locks. He said, that's the source of my strength. Is it having long hair that did it? No, it was obedience to God and making a commitment to God and doing what God said that brought blessing into his life. And when he broke that, all of his strength went from him. And the first thing that they did was they took him and they put out his eyes. See, that's what happens when someone steps away. They lose sight of what's happening around them. They lose sight of their relationships. They lose sight of God. I said that the enemy put him at a mill grinding in a circle of what normally an ox would do. And that's what the enemy does. God, the, the Satan will bring them into a place where they, they end up grinding in, in a circle. And that's, that's what their life becomes. They're, they're blind. They can't see. And it's so amazing because he did this. And the Bible said, but I love this. It said, but how be it? The hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaven. Now, they just figured I could cut his hair. She actually cut his hair. They, I, I'm not even sure they realized that. But his hair began to grow again after it was shaven. I don't know how much time he spent there grinding at the mill. Probably an entire season. Probably a year. Probably, I don't know how long he was there. But there was a time then that they wanted to bring him in and make sport of him, laugh at him, the great hero of Israel. The Bible said that whenever they brought him up, he was blind. They put a child to lead him by the hand to show how weak he was, how insignificant he was. 
And so the child leads him up in this huge coliseum. Pillars, beautiful pillars, everything. And Samson says, where am I? And he told him. And he said, he knew the place. And he said, put my hand on the pillars. So the young man took his hand and put it on the pillar. And he prayed. And he said, God, remember me one more time. Just remember me one more time. The Bible said he pushed on the pillars and they came down and the entire building collapsed and said there was more Philistines killed at his death than all of his life put together. So I'm fascinated by that. What an incredible story. What an unfortunate story. Amazing story of Samson, his exploits, the things that he did. <laughs> and how he recovered himself in the presence of God. Well, of course, I'm still intrigued with those seven locks that he's got. What is it about those seven locks that really stands out to me? Because here's Samson. He's not to shave his head, and when he finally gets his hair cut, he's got seven locks. Well, you find that over in 2 Peter chapter 1. Can I read that to you? Here's what chapter, chapter 1 of 2 Peter says. Look at this. I love this verse, verse, this verse 3. According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Now, listen, everything you need has been given to you already. How? Through the knowledge of him. You've already got it. Everything you need to be successful. You're not need to pray God sends something else. Everything you need has been given you by the word of God. Now we can see that. According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to, unto glory and virtue. Now, all right, where is that knowledge? Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Where are the promises? That's in that Bible you're holding in your lap. He said he's given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises you might be a partaker of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, let me just pause there for one second. You're going to, you're going to be a partaker of the divine nature by getting into the Word. It's in the Word of God, the divine scriptures, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Right here, I have a promise in there. I have a promise of healing. I have a promise of deliverance. I have a promise of peace. He's given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises, I can be a partaker of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, let's talk about Samson's seven locks, would you? Let's go down to verse, the, the next verse. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Now, what is faith? Faith is something that's, that's, to me, that's like his scalp. That's the, thing that, that's the thing that the enemy can't take from you. He can take everything else, but he ain't going to take your faith. Have faith in God. Listen to this. Besides this, add to, your, add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge. To your knowledge temperance. And to your temperance, patience. To your patience, godliness. And to your godliness, brotherly kindness. And to your brotherly kindness, charity. Now, I love this. Look at this. For if these things, these seven things, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, if these things be in you and abound, they will make you that you are neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind. He's had his eyes put out, and he cannot see afar off, and he's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now look at this. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence. Be diligent about this. Make your calling election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Can you imagine? And he said, an entrance will be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is a powerful, powerful word. So what happens is, 
is we have things in our life that have, that, that have contributed to the Word of God working in us. Okay? What things, what things contribute? Well, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. Those seven things, they add something to the Word that works in Have, have you ever seen people, who, the Word doesn't work for them? And they've got such a bad attitude about everything. The Bible says a husband and wife, they shouldn't strive because their prayers become hindered. In other words, your actions, your activities can affect whether or not those exceeding great and precious promises are working for you. Are, are they working for you? Well, I prayed and nothing happened. Yes, okay. Well, the first place I need to do is to check my life. Have I had my, had, have I had my hair cut have I had those seven locks? Do I still possess them? Do, do I still know what brotherly kindness is? Do I still know what godliness is? See, these are, these are attributes that determine how we walk with one another. When we're walking in love, when we begin to walk in peace with one another, it positions us for the word to produce for us. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises you can, you, you can walk in the kingdom of God and escape the corruption that is in the world. But how? By the exceeding great and precious promises. But you're going to have to add these things to you. One is virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is the quality to do what is right. You know, you may mess up, but you got within you virtue. It's the quality to do what's right. We talk about the virtuous woman from Proverbs 31. The virtuous woman. What did she? You saw her virtue by the choices she made. She had the quality to do what was right. And then knowledge. See, we're going to have to have an understanding of what knowledge brings to us. Verse 2, verse 3 said, He's given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, I might be a partaker of the kingdom of God. So you got virtue, knowledge, temperance. Temperance, I love temperance. Steel is, is actually uh, prepared by varying degrees of heat and cold. Tempered steel, uh, when, when, depending on the building you're going to put up, that, sometimes they want tempered steel, something that's not going to break when the pressure gets on it. See, a lot of times we don't understand that we become so flexible that if somebody doesn't smile at us wrong, we just absolutely collapse. You're lacking temperance. You're lacking temperance. You're not holding up under any pressure. Well, they said this to me, and it hurt my feelings, and I'm going to quit. You need to be temperate. The Bible says, he that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. What does that mean? That means it doesn't matter what I face, I'm, I'm not yielding. I, I may bend, but I'm not going to break. I'm temperate. I'm, I'm consistent. I'm strong under the load. And then he said, add patience. Now, what's patience? I've heard people say, don't pray for patience because trouble comes. That's simply not true. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says tribulation works patience. Patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. He said, you've got to add that to your life. What does patience do? Whenever troubles come, patience goes to work saying, God is true and his word is true, and there's nothing that I'm going to yield to that's going to bring me down. A person who's patient, they never, their countenance doesn't change because things go wrong around them. They know how it's going to turn out. The Bible talked about, uh, in, in Jesus was talking about the worst tribulation that could ever come on the earth. And right in the middle of it, he said, and in your patience, you possess your soul. Patience means it's the, it's the soldier on guard that protects and defends the city. It protects and defends your mind. While your faith has gone out to the mountain, patience stays at home and guards the mind. It'll surprise you how many times you find faith and patience working together. They're actually called the power twins. So patience is very important. I see people, and that doesn't just mean, well, I'm patiently enduring this thing. No, what it means is, is when I'm patient, that means I'm standing strong and my countenance doesn't change no matter what comes, no matter what goes. My patience, I'm, I'm strong in patience. Then he said to your, add to your, 
virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience. The, well, here's another one, godliness. What separates you from the world system and how that looks? It's, it's, not, it's not being holier than thou, but there's an attitude of God that I take on myself. I embrace, I embrace what is godly. I, I allow myself, I, I worry about Christians who take no thought to lifestyles that doesn't reflect him at all. And, it, and it's very unfortunate. And we don't realize how that's still a lock of hair. That's still one of the things that sustains you. So he said, then godliness, add to your godliness brotherly kindness. Dear God, we could build our church on brotherly kindness. Did you know it? People are just looking for someone to be kind to them. <laughs> they are. Always looking for somebody. I, I've heard people say, and, and you know the reputation I would love to have for our church is the fact that that's the friendliest place I've ever been. I, I pray that you get squeezed before you leave. We are a hugging church, and I'm not going to repent for that. I pray that that's genuine and from our heart and that we love everybody. I don't care. And the Lord gave me, the Lord gave me this when I first started ministry. He said, the Lord spoke this to me. He said, if you're going to hug one, you have to hug them all. I, I knew what that meant. But see, add to your brotherly kindness, then what? Love, charity. And he said, if these things be in you and abound, they will make you that you're neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Samson, come on, you're living like hell. Get your act together. So how are we going to get our act together? It reflects through these seven things. What, where do you stand in regard to virtue and to knowledge and to temperance? to patience, godliness, to brotherly kindness, to charity. Those are the seven locks. Did you know that virtue is usually the, I believe that was the first lock that was cut. Virtue is usually the first thing to go when somebody goes south. The quality to do what is right. God is calling us to a higher place than we realize. The hand of the Lord is upon us. And I want to just say to every single one of you that the Lord has called you He's called you to an area of ministry. He's called you into an area of life. And God, there, but there's a requirement upon you just as was with Samson. Now, unfortunately, we're always going to have those attitudes toward one another. Somebody say, I'll never get in a fight with my mate again. Well, if she behaves, I won't. That's, <laughs> that's going to happen. But what about these seven locks? What about these seven locks? Where do you stand with these seven locks? You may say, I've lost everything. I've compromised to the point that I've lost everything. You know what the Bible said concerning Moses or concerning Samson? It said, howbeit the hair of his head begin to grow again after it was shaven. Amen. God's got a formula we can put on that bold head. <laughs> so I want you right now, I just want you to take a moment and I just want you to absorb just a few moments the life of Samson and then Lay that over against your life. Where do you stand? Where do you stand by way of brotherly kindness? <laughs> what, does it, what does it take to just really tick you off? Where do you stand when it comes to temperance? Exactly where do you stand when it comes to the point of abandoning someone because they didn't do just right? What's the attitude you have towards someone that's different than you? 
that shows that's a reflection of why the Bible doesn't work for you. Amen. Because he said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises you might be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And he said, and besides this, add diligence, do diligence, add, add, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. And if these things be in you and abound, they will make you that you are neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and he cannot see afar off and he's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will ensure an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How powerful that that is. So this reflects to us today. So I'm just going to say right now, if you've got an attitude, lose it. If you got unforgiveness, let it go. Are you holding people prisoner? Forgive them. Is there something in your life that's out of order with God? Come on, we have a job to do. And we don't want to end up in a place to where the enemy has this just grinding in circles, losing out on the effectiveness of what we have been called to. So we're about to enter into some things that I believe is going to be very powerful for our church. Very powerful. I want you right now, I just want you to open your heart because God's wanting to use you. He doesn't want you being sidelined whenever all the action's going on. You need to be right smack in the middle of it. And what we want to do is say, Lord, I hear am I. Here am I, Lord, send me. See, God's not looking for the perfect or he never would have chosen Peter. It's the truth. He never would have chosen Judas. He never would have chosen the sons of thunder. We're going to kill them. That's what we'll do. We'll call fire down from heaven. Really? See, we're not looking for the perfect, but we are looking for people who had virtue, knowledge, and temperance. We add that. God doesn't add that. We add that. We add that. So right now, we'll just take and we'll just make the decision. I'm just going to add those things. I'm going to add virtue to my life. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to add temperance to my life. I'm not going to fluctuate because of, because of the hot or the cold. I'm going to add patience to my life. I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to add brotherly kindness, charity. I'm going to add love to my life right now. So we just pray with me. Father, I want to thank you for the Word of God that works in our life so graciously. As we look at the life of Samson and the important part that he played in history, Lord, I, we, we, we reflect on his imperfections, but see how you used him in spite of those things. And Lord, we reflect on those seven locks and what that means to us and how we, Lord, can apply them to our life to where we begin to walk in the perfection of your word. We just pray, oh God, that we will have an entrance into the kingdom of God and that things won't be stolen from us. So, Lord, I just bless this house. I bless this house, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Let's just sing that. Let's just sing that, would you? Good. Thing. 